book one chapter four of red masquerade this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by carolyn red masquerade by lewis joseph vance book one a chapter from the youth of monsieur michael lanyard chapter four the fool and his money one reflected rather bitterly on the many and obvious oversights of a putatively all-wise providence in especial on its failure so to fashion the body of man as to enable him on occasion to discipline his own flesh in the most ignominious manner imaginable lanyard could have kicked himself that is to say he wanted to and thought it rather a pity he couldn't and publicly at that for the freak he had just indulged was rank quichotism something which had as much place in the code of a man of his calling as milk of human kindness in the management of a pawn-shop on second thought he wasn't so sure it might have been that quichotism had inspired his infatuate gesture but it might quite as conceivably have been everyday vanity or plain cussedness a noble impulse to serve a pretty lady in distress a spontaneous device to engage her interest or a low desire to plague a personality as antipathetic to his own as that of a rattlesnake in point of simple fact he decided his impelling motive had been a mixture of all three in all these respects furthermore it proved notably successful in the two last named without delay the princess sophia at once took note of lanyard with wonder some misgivings and a hint of admiration for he was not only a personable person in those days with a suggestion of devil-may-care in his air that measurably lifted the curse of his superficial foppishness but he was putting a spoke in prince victor's wheel and whosoever did that by chance out of sheer voluptuousness or with malice prepense won immediate title to sophia's favourable regard if she couldn't thwart victor herself she would be much obliged to anybody who could and did and she was nothing loath to betray her bias by looking kindly upon her self-appointed champion a whispered communication from lady diantha did nothing to abate her overt approbation as for victor his face of leaden grey took on a tinge of green he quaked with rage and the glare he loosed on lanyard made that young man wonder if he were mistaken in believing that the eyes of the prince shone in that dusky room with something nearly akin to the phosphorescence to be seen in the eyes of an animal at night the notion was amusing lanyard paid it the tribute of a quiet smile in direct acknowledgment of which prince victor snarled six thousand guineas and a hundred lanyard added brief pause prefaced a bid designed to quelch him completely ten thousand in a fatigued voice he uttered one hundred more fifteen this time lanyard contented himself with nodding to the auctioneer and the lips of the latter had barely parted to parrot the bid when victor sprang to his feet his features working his limbs shaking so that the legs of the chair beside him whose back he seized 
chattered on the floor while the high-pitched voice broke into a screech twenty and lanyard said and one twenty thousand one hundred guineas chanted the auctioneer are there any more bids you sir he aimed a respectful bow at prince victor who snubbed him with a sign of fury going going gone sold to monsieur lanyard for twenty thousand and one hundred guineas and lanyard had the satisfaction of seeing prince victor after a vain effort to master his emotion snatch up his topper clap it on his head and make for the door with footsteps whose stuttering haste was in poor accord with the dignity of his exalted station but it was debatable whether this satisfaction plus the possession of a questionable corot was worth its cost as lanyard wasn't in the humour now that the heat of contest began to abate to look to princess sophia for promise of further reward even if he could have been guilty of such impertinence indeed he must have forborne for every shame after all he told himself he hadn't figured very creditably permitting pity prejudice to sway him as it had he felt singularly sure he had played the gratuitous ass in this affair and he didn't in the least desire to see the reflection of a like conviction in the eyes of a pretty young woman with a flair for the ridiculous he dissembled his diminished self-esteem however most successfully as he proceeded to the desk of the auctioneer's clerk filled in a cheque for the amount of his purchase and gave instructions for its delivery whether by intention or inadvertence he was followed from the auction room by the princess sophia and lady diantha mainwaring and just outside the entrance he found prince victor waiting with all the air of a gentleman impatient for a cab to happen along and pick him up out of the drizzle but in view of the fact that he made no overtures to a passing hansom which swerved into the curb in response to a signal of lanyard's cane this last concluded that the prince was up to his reputedly favourite game of waylaying his rebel wife if such were the case lanyard had no wish to witness a public wrangle between the two so he stepped briskly up on the carriage block and only hesitated when he saw that the prince utterly ignoring the presence of the princess and lady diantha was edging forward and cocking an alert ear to catch the address which lanyard was on the point of giving the cabby hugely diverted the adventurer looked around with a quirk of his brows and amiably commented monsieur's interest is so flattering if you really must know i'm going home now to my rooms in half moon street au revoir monsieur le prince he beamed benignly upon that convulsed countenance and saw crestfallen prince victor slink away to the music of smothered laughter from the ladies in the doorway toward which lanyard was careful not to look then in high feather with himself he chirped to the driver and hopped into the hansom end of book one chapter four